thank you all for coming and uh, thank some of you for coming to both my talks today. <laughs> um, but so in this talk, I'll be talking about the concept of modeling single cell data, basically, generally speaking, as a graph, and then using um, the features that come with single cell data, whether they be proteins or genes, as features on the graph to do certain kinds of machine learning operations on them. So if you either heard my other talk or there might have been a recording of it, um, that in that talk I talked a lot about how you'd use graph signal processing to improve graph neural networks. So in this talk, because I'm trying to keep them disjoint, but both with exciting applications, I will not be talking about graph neural networks. So if you're more interested in that, you can either ask me about it. Um, okay, so basically when we're looking at cellular data, we're basically looking at a very, very complex system and we want to learn something about the underlying system by looking at data. So we have something like 20,000 different gene variables and from those we want insights that are somewhat lower dimensional but are complex nonlinear combinations of the things we measure. Um, so the genes are all heavily interacting. And um, so there's kind of a reverse engineering problem or an inverse problem that can we uncover these kinds of things from the data sets that we have. But there's a few challenges in single cell data specifically uh, but also in most of biology. Uh, one of them is noise. There's a lot of noise in single cell data. I think you've probably heard the measurements that about 95% of the transcripts are dropped out. Uh, but it is very, very high dimensional. So there's this idea that we want to learn some kind of simplified representation of the state space. Um, there's also many different kinds of data that could be um, integrated. Um, there's also dynamics in the data and the dynamics part of the data um, is not completely apparent to us because we see freeze frames of cells frozen in time. So one of the approaches that we use, and I won't go into how to learn dynamics, but we actually use graph-based approaches, is to figure out a density uh, estimate of cells on a graph and then figure out how they're transported over time and interpolate that transportation. So basically, in order to handle a lot of these challenges, what we do is uh, we try to induce a structure in the data that allows us to do interesting mathematical operations. And you can probably guess from the title of this talk that that structure has to do with graphs. But really, in single cell data, it comes from a different idea. It comes from a more continuous math idea called manifolds. So the idea is there's data in ambient space but it may lie on or near a collection of low dimensional manifolds. And it turns out that this idea is very um, useful in single cell biology. Um, I have a couple of review, two to three reviews on it now, on multi-scale manifold learning, but other people do too because it turns out to be a good assumption for single cell data. The reason is because the things we're measuring genes, they're all uh, talking to each other, they all have redundant information which restricts their state space. And it turns out these manifolds, in turn, can be well represented by graphs of certain sorts. Um, so one way of turning a data set into a kind of a graph, which can then be a representation of the underlying manifold, or it's actually, a, you can think of it the other way, as a discretization of the underlying manifold, is to take the data and convert it to distances take those distances and push them through an affinity kernel, like a Gaussian kernel uh, or an exponential kernel or whatever kind of box kernel, any kind of kernel you choose. And that can give you a graph where local connections are emphasized. And another operation that we do is to create another operator from this uh, affinity or adjacency matrix called a diffusion matrix. And that involves normalizing the affinities or so each um, each data point here has some affinity to other data points based on passing the distance through an affinity kernel. But in the diffusion operator, those affinities are all turned into probabilities. And that gives you probabilities of random walk, but it turns out it also gives you a filter of signals on this graph. And I'll tell you about that a little bit more later. And downstream of learning this kind of graph, you can do all kinds of things like clustering and visualization. 
And if you think about the methods that you might have heard of, very popular methods in single cell data, they all use graph slash manifold representations. UMAP does. Uh, Louvain clustering uses a, uses a graph. Many of them use, use a graph construct because it's, it's such a good m model of the, this kind of data. So I'm going to talk about uh, thinking about graphs and features as signals on the graphs a little bit further than what some of these methods think of. Some of the methods just create the graph and then they partition the graph, which is like Louvain. Um, but I'm really going to talk about how you can use the graph as a substrate for gene signals that lie on the graph. So I'll give you an example. If this is a cell-cell graph, so these are cells that are similar to one another as determined by the cellular affinity. Now let's say you had a gene on each, that you've measured in each cell. Of course, there's a lot of dropout on this gene, so it could be very noisy. But you have this gene signal. But if you felt that the gene signal should be smooth on the graph, you can take this signal and you can smooth it over the graph uh, using signal processing operation called low-pass filtering, and you would recover signals. In fact, that was my first paper on single cell data called MAGIC, which basically does that. Um, and so it's very useful to think of gene, genes or proteins or whatever you have, whatever unit of measurement you have in your single cell data as actually signals back on this graph that we've all been using. Um, so the question is, can we process signals on graphs like they're done in uh, audio and image processing? Because then it would be really, really useful. So people might have taken some kind of signal processing class. You always look at signals that are one-dimensional or two-dimensional. But what about signals on graphs? And that's kind of what the tutorial part of this talk is going to be about, the idea that you can translate signal processing operations onto a graph, and how exactly do you do it? Um, so if you think about time series signals, um, like signals that you get in your radio that vary over time, they can be represented in two ways. They can be represented in the time domain or they can be represented in a different way called the Fourier domain. So the, this duality between the time and Fourier domain gives signal processing a lot of power because there's things that you can do easily in the Fourier domain, like remove high frequency noise, that are very hard to do in the time domain. But the vice versa is true too. There's some things that are easier to do in the time domain that's harder to do in the frequency domain. So I'll just talk a little bit about things that can be done in the Fourier domain. So the basis of this is the Fourier transform. This is really remarkable because it was invented uh, something like 400 years ago. and still so relevant today. Um, the idea of the Fourier transform is to come up with what are called these Fourier coefficients. These co Fourier coefficients are discovered by integrating whatever your signal is, whether it's on time, uh, by this kind of waveform, which is called a harmonic. And this has a very particular frequency, and this frequency is given by what's multiplying x here. So higher frequency means the waveform is oscillating more frequently. Lower frequency means it's oscillating less frequently. So what you do in Fourier uh, transforming or Fourier decomposition is you take signals and you break them up into their constituent frequencies, and then such that their sum is the original signal again. So the way you do it is a Fourier transform. Often we don't have access to the full continuous functional form of the signal. We've taken samples. So we use the discrete Fourier transform, which takes whatever samples you've taken, xn of your signal. And it only uses discrete frequency. You see, it's only using fractions, multiple, multiples of this fraction here as the discrete wave forms that it's multiplying with. So it'll approximately recover your signal back. So that's the discrete Fourier transform. And a really good thing about it is these are linear operations, so just a matrix multiplication. Okay, so it turns out that this is, is useful because, um, so I already talked about things you can do. One thing you can do in the Fourier domain is filter your signal. Um, filtering means letting some frequencies through and inhibiting other frequencies. So if you're gonna let your low frequencies, things that move smoothly in time through, you're going to remove things that are like kind of glitchy or very high frequency, then you would utilize a low-pass filter. And that's the one that I talked about with um, the example of noise, which I'll show again. But, but it turns out in my talk on graph neural networks, what I actually talked about was the fact that graph neural network only, networks only do this. So if you only do low-pass filtering all the time, it turns out it's just like smoothing your signal infinitely until everything is just the same signal. 
and this is what underpowers graph neural networks. And I was talking about introducing other filters back into graph neural networks. But it's useful nevertheless also, also here. Um, so you can also have bandpass filters that select specific frequencies out, band stop that inhibit certain frequencies, again, if you feel like they're unwanted or uh, having an aspect of the signal that's undesirable, maybe, for example, cell cycle might be a certain frequency band. I don't know this for sure. I'm just throwing out this idea. So let me know if it works, if anyone tries it. Okay, so, but low-pass filtering basically, uh, you know, recovers from this noise more or less by smoothing over the pixels. So, there, so there's a duality in what happens in the graph domain and what happens in the frequency domain. Low-pass filtering in this frequency domain is equivalent to smoothing in the graph domain. So in graphs, to, to, to translate those operations into graphs, people have been working on the field called graph signal processing. And it's not that old of a field. It's only been around since, I don't know, 2013 or so. Um, and a lot of advances in graph neural networks are from that field, but it's kind of gone under the radar because people don't think signal processing is as hot as <laughs> geometry, so they call it geometric deep learning. Um, but I'll, I'll bring back signal processing here. Um, so the way you translate something like Fourier decomposition on the graph is you have to uh, create a matrix called the graph Laplacian. That matrix is not very hard to create. So recall that if you have a graph like this, you can represent it as an adjacency matrix. That means you have these nodes, they're written in some order. Here they're written in the order 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And because node 1 is adjacent to nodes 2 and 5, there's a 1 in the 1, 2, and 1, 5 entry. So this is an adjacency matrix. This other matrix that you need to create a graph Laplacian is called the degree matrix. It's actually the sum of rows in the adjacency matrix, or literally how many edges a node has coming out of it. So if you subtract the adjacency matrix from the degree matrix, you get this Laplacian matrix. You might want to notice that both the adjacency matrix, degree matrix, and Laplacian matrix are really nice. And when someone in linear algebra says something's really nice, they just mean it's a uh, symmetric matrix. <laughs> that the matrix is the same as its transpose. This is great because that means we can eigen decompose the matrix, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and eigen decompositions are what's going to enable the Fourier transforms. So just a little note on graph Laplacians. You, um, the simple one or the unnormalized one is the one I showed here, degree minus adjacency. You could also normalize out by degrees. Um, this gives you a normalized Laplacian. And there's another useful one called random walk Laplacian. This is related to the random walk operator, where every row of the adjacency sums to 1 and is a probability. It's the operator that I talked about before. Um, so you can also create a graph Laplacian from that operator. So in order to get your waveforms that create your uh, Fourier decomposition in this setting, you just have to use the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian. And we know it's eigen decomposable because it's a positive semi-definite matrix. So and it's a symmetric matrix, so its eigenvalues are all real. And these real eigenvalues can be interpreted as frequency, proportional to the frequency. So you can tell which one is low frequency and which one is high frequency. And in fact, if you use eigs or something like that, it gives them to you in order. So it'll be in frequency order for you already. Um, so you, and so uh, if you want to know what that looks like, um, this is one of the low frequency eigenvectors on the graph. So it gives you a value for every cell or every data point. And actually, this is kind of interesting. If this happened to be your cellular data graph, and I was telling someone who's not here, who's in pop gen actually, that you could actually correlate this eigenvector with um, one of your genes. And that could tell you what's forming a lot of the variation in your graph. Or you can look at which eigenvector is fairly constant on this, because that gives you a way of sort of clustering your graph. So basically, the eigenvectors are like you'd expect. The higher frequency ones oscillate a lot. They cross zero many, many times. The lower frequency ones will only cross zero once. So in fact, when people do spectral clustering, they're just taking this eigenvector and cutting it at zero. So that, may, that gives you a partitioning of your data graph. Okay, So that's spectral clustering. Um, and and that, that actually works because this is a low frequency harmonic. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. Um, so, uh, so again, this graph Fourier transform using these eigenvectors u can be used to flip flip back and forth between the uh, vertex domain and the frequency domain, back and forth. Um, so still linear operations, matrix multiplication operations. 
So you can do filtering in the spectral domain. So remember, low-pass filtering corresponded to sort of smoothing things, which actually diffusion also does. But you can have more complicated kinds of filter that is designed to remove specific kinds of noise if you had a noise model. And we're really seeing more papers on other noise models than, than magic shortly. Um, so to create any arbitrary filter, what you have to do is you take some signal, and you have this signal, and you will modulate its frequency components. So this h function gives you some other value here other than whatever the frequency is. So let's say you wanted to remove the low frequency. You have to design your h so that it gives you 0 for the lower frequencies and keeps the higher frequencies. So it's all in the construction of this h is how you create the filter. And then when you do this operation, if Fourier transforms your signal, modulates the Fourier components, transforms it back. So that's how you apply the signal to the graph. That, that's how you apply the filter to the graph. Um, another uh, issue is that sometimes the eigen decomposition is considered expensive. So you can also design filters as polynomials of your graph Laplacian. So um, it turns out that you can use any polynomial of your graph Laplacian. So it's your graph Laplacian with a coefficient powered. Some spe specific ones that are used are polynomial filters and Chebyshev filters. Uh, Chebyshev filters have this recurrent type of designed polynomial that they already have. And it turns out that the diffusion operator is also a polynomial of the Laplacian, right? Sorry, this should be a P. It's just identity minus the Laplacian. So the diffusion operator itself is a filter where you don't have to eigen decompose. Um, so the diffusion operator, again, is uh, created by rho normalizing your adjacency matrix. And raising it to the teeth power and applying your signal back will diffuse that signal. So if you raise the diffusion operator to the teeth power and you apply it to your signal, it'll low pass filter your signal uh, and it recovers all, uh, it kind of smooths the graph based on um, the diffusion probabilities. So it replaces each value with a weighted average of its diffusion adjacencies. So this was the idea in our magic paper from 2018, which recovers this data. Um, and today I want to talk to you a little bit more about another application we had more related to density estimation, which is called MELD. This came out a couple of years ago. And we utilized MELD uh, in order to compare between two data graphs, um, basically two point cloud sets of data or more, because it, these could be data sets that were collected under different conditions. Um, just making sure I have like 10 or 11 minutes, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So the idea is you have single cell data collected under condition one and data collected under condition two. But it's very difficult to tell what is the difference between these conditions, right? So if you, I use FATE because it's a technique we developed. So if you use UMAP, you may say they see the same thing. You see a lot of overlap between these, right? So I don't know what's actually very different. Um, oh no, what's happening? It's like transcribing everything I say. Maybe we should ask <laughs> chat GPT to correct everything I say or something. Okay, so basically what we want to do is figure out how to disentangle these. So we have this model in our head actually that what's really happening is the overall cellular manifold, the states that are reachable by a cell type are not changing. That it's more the density along that manifold that are changing. So we need a method of estimating density on the manifold. So um, you could then compare the density and say there are certain regions that are enriched for one data type versus another. So if you go to a certain location, it's more likely that it comes from one data type versus one condition versus another. And actually, uh, uh, some people, when they do this, what they do is they cluster first. So if you cluster the data, then you're ar arbitrarily chopping the data up in some way. And then you're saying which cluster has more expression in e each of the data sets. But the resolution of the clustering may have nothing to do with the resolution of the difference between your data sets. So then you're getting some spurious information from it. So what we would recommend is actually first figure out where the differences in your manifold are, and then use that in your clustering to actually cluster out the portions that are really different. So actually invert the ordering of that, whereas overwhelmingly people still do this. They just chop up the data and say, OK, which is differentially expressed in your two clusters. Um, so how do you do density estimation on a graph? You can uh, do what's called a kernel density estimation 
by again applying a certain kind of filter to a graph. Uh, I w so basically what we end up doing is we take both the sets of data, create a joint data graph from it, and then we place indicator signals. That's a one for this signal every time the cell comes from condition one, and it's a one in this signal every time the cell comes from the condition two. So you have two indicator signals. These don't look really like density estimates, but you can turn them into a density estimate uh, by using a heat kernel to smooth this out. Okay, um, and it turns out that you can also derive the heat kernel if you have the right conditions on this kind of constrained optimization, that you want the signal to be smooth, and yet you want the smooth signal to reconstruct the graph. So once you do that, you can get um, a Gaussian kernel density estimate, um, it's, also unique, uh, it's also the unique solution to a Fourier heat equation, and it gives you, uh, and you can get it using this kind of heat kernel version of the Laplacian. So once you have that density estimate, um, you have two signals, and actually those density estimates themselves are new signals. So you can also analyze them using frequency component analysis. If the density is rapidly changing, that's probably an area of transition, if both signals have even density in a certain location, then that area is probably not affected by whatever your condition is. If your conditions are perturbation, but in this, in this area of the cellular state space, both samples are, have equal density, then it didn't do anything to them. Uh, and you can also correct for, for these things. So from this den these density estimates, we can turn these into a likelihood by using an uninformative prior. So now we have a score for every single cell that says how likely is it to come from one condition to another. And this is a very useful kind of analysis because I could just pick out the cells that are more likely, highly more likely to come from one condition than the other condition. So now if you do this, we've colored it with this, uh, after meld, with this likelihood signal. This likelihood signal can then allow us to threshold cells that are highly likely to come from one condition versus another versus the cells that could have come from either. And it turns out when, the, when we put this into gene set enrichment analysis, we get much more meaningful um, attributes of the cellular, uh, of the two conditions and what's going on in these pathways. So this is using that signal and then clustering. Uh, okay, um, so maybe the last example that I'll go over is this one, which has to do with coarse graining data. I'm going to skip the last the very last example I had. Um, so as you saw, when you apply the diffusion operator to the data, it creates a low pass filter and it smooths the data, so it kills some variability. So we decided to use this repeatedly to get kind of a continuous coarse graining of the data. And we call this process diffusion condensation. So, and what that process is, is it's, it's computing the diffusion operator from data using these steps, then applying the diffusion operator to the data in this step, and then recalculating. So it, what it's doing is no longer smoothing, but it's killing variability and coming up with these discrete clustering structures that cluster at every level of granularity, and this already appeared. But one thing we noticed was the way it was sweeping granularities was very similar to what our friends in topological data analysis were doing. Except for this is, filth, this is condensing on the manifold. So we decided to define it as a proper filter. And the filter is literally to low pass filter at every point without eigen decomposing. So it's pretty fast and then recomputing the operator. And you can even see, look at it in the graph Fourier domain. Uh, how this smoothing, especially if you raise it to high powers, kills more and more frequency. So you can actually set what the T should be. So we have a very recent paper that we used to analyze age-related macular degeneration data. This was actually the first single cell atlas of macular degeneration generated by my collaborator Brian Haffler. The idea is basically that we use this diffusion condensation process at many different levels. And we can use some kind of topological measure to say which level is most interesting to us. So the top level, the most persistent clusters that you get are all the ones that immunologists and biologists sort of think of. But that's not the level at which you get the most important information. 
For one thing you can see is that the two most differentially mm, expressed in terms of genes and cell types are microglia and astrocytes and also vascular here. So if we zoom into these, we can see substructure. And what I'm doing here is I'm just drawing the new diffusion operator data with our same FATE technique. So now you've zoomed in and you've gotten additional cluster structures. So basically this diffusion condensation process first starts out with all the data points by themselves and it's, co uh, and it's collecting them. Eventually we've proven that it'll all be one point. But you can go backwards when you zoom in by keeping track of the tree. Uh, once we did that, we saw very specific activation signatures that were higher in early forms of AMD. And these were not all of the microglia. We saw them both in microglia and astrocytes. They're a very specific subcluster of them. And then we looked at other neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis. And actually, we saw these same signatures enhanced in all of these early neurodegeneration conditions. But if you didn't do that, and if you went with the canonically gated populations, you'd lose these. That's why they hadn't been published before. Because actually, these two data sets were not ours. We just downloaded and used them. Um, so by continuously coarse graining the data using this signal processing filtration, we're able to get to different levels of the data that's grouping the cells differently. And at some level, we get the information about what's different between the conditions more prominently. And we were able to validate the signature in all of these conditions. This is using RNA scope. And we also validated it in retinal tissue. And actually, in the late stage, it turns out that, and I'm going to end, end the talk here, in the late stage, it turns out that this common signature we see between the diseases goes away. And that's because they have specific tissue mechanisms that they use to advance what's going on. So basically, the microglia and the astrocytes start talking to each other. They create sort of an inflammatory cascade that elicits certain uh, cytokines, most specifically IL-1B. And that induces the retinal cells to have uh, growth factor induction. And so we were also able to show in the paper that you can block IL-1B and stop this from happening. So these are just some examples. So I showed you magic, which denoises. I showed you MELD, which does density estimation. It turns out we have another paper called Diffusion Earth Movers Distance that uses the MELD density estimation to come up with an Earth Movers Distance. I didn't go over that. And then I used this in kind of a coarse graining TDA style to come up with multi-level organizations of the data. So these were all basically a result of the idea of creating signal filters on graphs and varying their variability. I didn't have time to go into the last application, but that was describing signals as they're um, flashing uh, here. And I, we do that with a wavelet transform version of graph signals. And so these are calcium signaling signals flashing in single cells. And it actually turns out that we can tell that these are not random and that they're sweeping a very clean trajectory. And I can show it to you here. Uh, this is a fate, fate visualization of the signaling pattern as captured by a graph wavelet transform. And you see they look like they're random, but they're actually uh, mapping out a very clean trajectory. But if you look at other data types like neurons, they don't do that. And the reason is because these calcium signals are in epithelial cells where they're there for homeostasis. So they're just like, sweep, sweep, are you okay, are you okay, are you okay? That's not what's happening with calcium signals at all in neurons, so they don't have that smooth structure. So this was a paper that just came out too, but I won't have time to talk about it. <laughs> all right, thank you.